Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to STC for providing the exhibition opportunity. And thank you, Gina, for inviting me. Starting off, this is me, of course. This is probably about 12 years ago. Uh, during spring break, I'm up on 281 out in front of the uh, ranch where there was this really nice bloom of thistles. You can see them right here. And so I just went out and started painting. And I do that. I'll just find locations locally that I find interesting and, and start a painting. There I am, same scenario. Somebody pulled up and saw what I was doing, was interested, took a few pictures, and then emailed them to me. That happens from time to time. And you can see how thickly the uh, thistles were blooming. It was really nice. Quite a few people were stopping to enjoy them. And then I think the owners of the land got tired of people doing that because they came in and mowed everything down. Now, this is a painting that I did about 10 years ago in my backyard. And it's actually on display now over at Imus as a part of a, another landscape show that they're doing. They own this painting now. And this is a wasachi tree and it grew up in my backyard. Those are my dogs. So there's a, my neighborhood. I literally just step out my front door. I'm just propped up a big canvas uh, in my garage and I'm looking down the street. That's the corner. As Gina said, I, I was born and raised in Edinburgh. I live there now. I paint what I respond to. One summer, I let the wild sunflowers take over the backyard. You know, they come up in the summertime. I just let them grow all over the place, specifically so I could go out there and paint them. That painting is now at the EBC building here in McAllen. Esteban Ortega Brown, he owns that painting and a few others of mine. That's an older piece too. That's a little over 10 years old. It's on display at the UTRGV campus in what's called the Hager building. That's not actually the name of that building, but it was an old Hager factory that was right off the interstate that the uh, university acquired and they've turned it into office spaces. And then they said, hey, Lyles, you got a bunch of paintings. Why don't you hang them over here? So it's on loan to the university. That I titled The Color of Heat. Okay, so yes, that's a mesquite tree. That's a big subject for me. That's one of my main subject matters is the mesquite trees. But the color is not natural color. I was trying to communicate how hot it is in August, you know, when everything's starting to brown out because it hasn't rained in a month, you know, and the grass is hard and sticky. And if you walk on it, it'll cut you. You know, what would that look like? How do you, how do you paint that? So I went with a, an exaggerated, almost print like quality color scheme lifted right out of comic books, to be honest. I was painting the campus, UTRGV campus. Right now, our art facility, our building is off campus. We're in South, South Edinburgh, off South Klausner. This is at the main campus. This is our student union at the main campus. And for a while, I was painting directly on campus. I have a long relationship with the institution. My father worked there as a microbiology professor from 67 up until about 80. 85, 84, when he left the university and went into real estate with his then second wife. I'm 55 now. I've got a 55-year relationship with that university. Growing up in Edinburgh, that was just a, a feature of, of our life. You know, there it was. It was part of our community. And the campus has always been something I responded to. So I was working on a series of paintings. This one is now also on loan to the university and sits in the president's office. I don't think he even knows who painted it. This one, another mesquite tree. This is in a field right next to our building. We're in an old Walmart building. Walmart went from being on South Klausner to building a new facility on, well, it was new 30 years ago, on 107, which used to be a drive-in theater. Our building is now in the old Walmart. University got it, converted it to offices. We finally got hold of it and moved in there full time. Okay, so that, all of that long story to get to, that this painting is at a bank in Mission, a local interior designer had a contract to decorate a, a bank and she bought some of my paintings in the bank. Well, the bank bought them. I also paint the sky. Now I've been showing you a lot of trees and plants, but I really like our local skies. Our sunsets are very, very dramatic. You know, we're pretty close to sea level. So you get this big fishbowl effect and the sky is this huge presence. And the color that one finds at, uh, in a South Texas sunset is really dynamic. And so I'll get out there and just paint from it directly. And these two are in a series that were developed simultaneously. You know, the clouds move pretty fast. Does that mean I was painting fast? No, not really. Uh, it means I set up the composition quickly and the color scheme rather quickly 
And then I went back in and worked it over and, you know, made adjustments as need be. That's part of the process. You can work in the field directly. And then quite often what happens is the artist will take the painting back to the studio and work with it. This is the Cats Stadium in Edinburgh, parking lot of Cats Stadium, what is now called Cats Stadium used to be Bobcat Stadium back when the world made sense. I have an affinity not only for the mesquite trees, but lonely spaces in general. And I found the parking lot to be actually quite intriguing, particularly because of the mesquite trees, the old growth mesquite trees that were left alone and allowed to shade the parking lot, which was sort of the point of these two paintings. They, they work as a pair. She casts a long shadow is the title of both of those works. So it's not about the stadium necessarily. It's not really about the parking lot. It's about the tree and its effect on the space around it or the effect of the space on the tree, as the case may be. That's the Wasachi tree I showed you earlier. It's older now. Uh, this is, I painted this actually two years ago. Now it's about a 15 year old tree. Now, I don't only paint landscapes. I do work in still life at times and known for doing pumpkin paintings. I brought in pumpkins into my painting classes and had the students work with them. And then I started working with them. And last year, here the Brownsville Art Museum invited me to come and do a pumpkin show. So that's what we did. I actually wanted to do that for a long time. This is a large painting and it's titled Nothing Gold Can Stay. I find that still life has a narrative element to it. The collection of objects on a tabletop or in a space and the artist's reaction to those objects is never just arbitrary. It always implies something. There's always a narrative. There's always some sort of association beyond just the joy of looking. There's another one. This is a diptych. It's also quite large. It's about 16 feet total, again, using the pumpkins as a motif. And I like this image. Somebody sent this to me, all the little kids in front of my paintings. They do little workshops and they had the kids come in and do stuff. And then they took them on tour through the show. And I like the way they were reacting to the painting. That one that they're looking at right there, this one with the pumpkin and the, and the roosters, that was called Calabaza con Pollo. Okay, and there I am giving a little talk at the opening of the show. I threw this in because I thought it was interesting. It's a picture of me giving a lecture and I'm at a lecture showing a picture of me giving a lecture. So it's kind of a circle of life, right? Okay, so history time. That's me. I was 22 years old when this picture was taken. And that was my then girlfriend. She's now my wife. We've been married 32 years, I think. So this is early on. As I said, I grew up in Edinburgh. I started my education at what was then Pan American University. 1990 was a very significant year for me. I wasn't really going anywhere fast. Pan Am had a small art department. I knew I wanted to be an artist. I knew I wanted to work in the visual arts. I knew I wanted to facilitate some sort of career in the visual arts. I wasn't at all sure how to do it. I was kind of meandering my way through an education. You know, I'd sign up for 12 hours and drop two classes and sign, you know, fail a class because I didn't go or just all the sort of slacker stuff you could possibly imagine. But I managed to keep my grade average up in art classes. So we had a poster that showed up on the wall of our building one day, Chautauqua Summer Art School. And this is all pre-internet. The poster would have had little postcards you could peel off and fill out and send in and they'd send you information. So I did that. I checked it out. And sure enough, it was something I was interested in. And I applied and got in and got the finances together. It wasn't that expensive, but it wasn't exactly cheap either. And I went. Chautauqua a Summer Art School was in Chautauqua County, New York. So this is in Western New York State, right off of Lake Chautauqua. The Chautauqua Institution had been around since before the Civil War, and they would establish little, uh, what they called Chautauquas, and they were little intellectual centers where they bring in guest lecturers of various different disciplines. And they had an art school. That was a very formative summer for me. Uh, Chautauqua was basically an eight-week art boot camp. And they focused on painting back then. That was the main focus. And it was just hardcore, you know, from sunup to sundown, and then lectures after dark, and just work, 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 work. Painting class in the morning, drawing class in the afternoon, back in the studios in the evening, go to dinner, go to lecture, go to bed, get up 6 a.m. the next day, do it all over again for eight weeks. That 
made a huge impact on me. At Chautauqua, I met this man. This is uh, Stanley Lewis. Stanley Lewis was one of the faculty during the summer program. At the time, he was also a faculty member at American University. He had just gotten hired on there, and he had formerly been at the Kansas City Art Institute. He was a force to be reckoned with. He just was a ball of energy. He has more energy now in his 80s than I do in my 50s. He's just a very energetic individual. There's a picture of him. He's actually doing a workshop in Italy in that image. I was interested in his work because he was doing the kind of work I was interested in doing and doing it in the way I was interested in doing it. It is very, very, very helpful as a young artist, as a burgeoning artist, as a student artist to have a model, someone that can kind of even just without saying it, but can show you the ropes, show you a pathway, show you how you can proceed. And he was very good about that, not by lectures and classes, but by just getting out in the field and painting, just by seeing him do what it is artists do, he became a role model. And here's a painting of his. This is actually Chautauqua Lake. So this is at the Institute. He lives in Massachusetts now. I think that's his front yard or somebody's front yard. Space is a huge issue in his work, and he can talk ad nauseum about space. And then that's actually at his house, looking out his studio door. So you can see definitely an influence on me. And then there I am. That's me sitting at the, the Oak Grove rest stop up on just north of the checkpoint. It's a good spot. So working in the field is definitely a part of the process. Working directly, plein air is what the French called it, open air painting. This method of landscape painting gained prominence or gained momentum, you could say, in the mid 19th century, talking 1860s. And in France, artists would go out to the countryside on the weekends. The weekend was kind of a new idea at the time. And France at the time was a military dictatorship. And one one of the ways that they controlled or attempted to control their population was to give them fun things to do. So this became sort of a way that the government, like I said, would keep the population busy, you know, keep them distracted from the fact that they really didn't have any rights per se. What emerged from that was Sunday painters. Okay, it was, became a hobby for the middle class, the bourgeois, the bougie. And out of that, you had artists who took that seriously. And then you get French Impressionism. Now, painting outside in the landscape was nothing new. It's been going on since at least the 17th century. Artists would go out into the landscape and make sketches. Okay, they would take a small paint kit. Go, you know, they were doing this in, uh, in England. Constable was one of the artists who did it. Just go make sketches, little small oil sketches, and then take all that information back to the studio and work up a big painting. It's nothing new. What was new about French Impressionism was saying the sketch is the art. The sketch is the painting. Plus, it's also post-industrial revolution, which means you have a whole new range of color. Then the collapsible metal tube. If you go to an art supply store, say Michael's or Hobby Lobby, you buy your paint and it comes in a collapsible metal tube. Okay, that's the invention of an American who actually worked for Windsor Newton Paint. The collapsible metal tube made French Impressionism possible. Okay, it wouldn't exist without that. Now, all of that to say this, this is what I do. Okay, or part of what I do. It's part of my process. There's my setup. Yes, I have a French easel, but I also use a shopping cart and they work really, really well. You know, a shopping cart and a few uh, electrical clips and you've got yourself an easel. You can see it's the paintings clipped on. There's actually a, a stick back there that's clipped onto the side of the cart. And then you get this great rest where you can put your easel and the whole thing's mobile. And when you're done, you put it back in the cart and you go back inside. There's the same set up different image, different time of day. I've gotten into the habit of documenting my process as I'm out in the field, you know, I'll document the subject matter. Uh, sometimes I'll document my setup or I'll document the painting. That's a bit poor picture of the painting, but it's a really good picture of the tree. And then there's the painting in process. And then there is the painting in the studio after I was done with it. That painting is actually on display in the exhibition in the library now. Let's talk a little bit about trees for a minute. Mesquite trees, I think they're amazing. Okay. I grew up in the valley. I was a teenager in the 1980s. We still had acres and acres of citrus groves everywhere. There was five miles of citrus grove and farmland between McAllen and Edinburgh. The entire city of Edinburgh was surrounded by citrus orchards in the fall when it was blooming. 
You could smell it on the breeze. Okay. So it was very much an agrarian based economy at the time. We then had a series of freezes in the 80s, starting in 83, three years of freezes during that decade that decimated the citrus industry. And growers were going out of business. They were selling off their land to recoup their losses. And you started seeing the emergence of the strip mall and housing projects and the diversification of the economy become from an agrarian economy to a more service sector economy. All of this has profoundly impacted the culture of our region. You know, you guys who are under 25, it wasn't always so busy. It used to be that you had individual small communities that are surrounded by agricultural produce or agricultural production. And each community had its own very specific flavor, you could say, you know, some of that still exists today, but it's less. What we've got now is much more service sector economy. We're becoming a metropolitan area, you know, without all of the infrastructure. And you get a lot more traveling around between, I mean, you know, you go to school in McAllen, live in FAR, go to work in Mission. That's common. So what I've seen is old growth mesquite trees getting pulled down. And there are areas of communities where there's still old growth trees that exist within a suburban environment. And that's what I respond to, that pressure between native ecology and urban development or suburban development. That's the one of the paintings in a small series. That was about six years ago from that tree at the uh, stadium parking lot. And then I did a larger painting. That's about two by three. Uh, again, my setup, literally, I will sometimes just go out in the front yard. And there's one of my, one of my shopping carts. Yes, I have many. That one actually came from Louisiana. I brought it with me when I moved down. I lived in Louisiana for a time. I didn't want to give it up. My wife was mad at me for packing that on the moving truck. I was like, nope, I'm taking it. That's in my backyard. That's the Wasatchia tree again. You know, if you're looking for something to paint, if you're a landscape painter, and I hope somebody is, you really don't have to go any further than your own backyard. Yes, there's some amazing things all through our region, but go check out your own backyard. See what's there. I have a Wasachi tree and about every two years it blooms. I mean, it blooms every year, but every two years, it's really, really amazing. Big, huge bloom. It started out this wimpy little, little bush and I decided to keep it. I didn't know what it was at the time. And it grew into this beautiful tree. So 17 years later, I got this great tree in my backyard that I go paint. So that's the process right there. I've just started the painting. I'm blocking it out. There it is. Really rough, really gestural. The great thing about on location painting is that it's very reactive. Light changes. I mean, like every half hour is a new composition just about. So you have to really move quickly. I'm trying to deal with space. I'm trying to deal with color. I'm trying to get a notion of what's going on in front of me. And so it, the paint winds up being very gestural. That's a later stage of the painting. When you're painting on location, it's very much about the experience of being there. And it's about time, what happens over the course of an afternoon. And then there's the finished painting. That painting is also in the show. Now that's one process, very direct, responsive, reaction, reactive approach to painting, painting observationally, picking and choosing what to put in, what to leave out, you know, reduction of form happens, editing of composition happening. Space is always the issue, space, space, space. Then there's other ways to approach it. Now, uh, on location painting is not the only thing I do. This painting, I said I did this 10 years ago. I actually started it in the backyard. I started it on location. Dogs are very bad models. They don't hold still. So what do I do? There's a huge separation between what you see, what your camera sees, and what the printer gives you. And as long as you're aware of that, there's a lot you can do. So I documented the information, had the painting already started, put in the dogs, made some decisions about some of the branches and stuff, and then went back out on location again. So it's a give and take process. You know, on location, in the studio, photographic resource, make some decisions back outside. And of course it's my own backyard, so it's not a big deal. And you know, within a couple of months, I've got a finished painting. Now I made a choice. I made this painting and you'll notice that, okay, I've got all these little blooms, these little yellow flowers. And then in the background, I've got all these oranges from very deep orange to a middle orange. Most people look at this painting and go, oh, what beautiful fall colors. There is not a tree south of San Antonio that looks like that in the fall. This is a Wasachi tree. It blooms in the spring. I made a formal choice. I chose to use orange as an underpainting. 
Okay. And my thought was I'll have, I wanted to capture the richness of the color of the blooms. And I felt I could do that best by layering it up, working up to yellow. So dark orange, middle orange, finally yellow, you know, get to yellow orange. And some of the blooms do that. But then I liked, right? I liked that. I liked this color. I liked the way it looked. I thought it was rich and appealing and thick. So I kept it. And now everybody thinks it's a fall painting. It's like, no, that's the Wasachi tree in spring. Look at it. It's this big, rich, beautiful thing with all just laden with these gorgeous flowers. The title of my show is Don't Be Hasty, which is a quote from a character from Lord of the Rings, Treebeard. Yes. I'm a nerd. Sorry. And one of the things the character says, one of the things Treebeard says, make a place for growing things and growing things come. I let this tree grow. It's about 17 years old now. And I've got lizard species coming in that I haven't seen in 30 plus years. I've got white winged doves nesting in the trees. I have to scare away the neighborhood cats, you know, all of that stuff. You allow the local flora to prosper even in a suburban environment and suddenly speciation begins to come in. You start seeing species show up that you may not have seen in a while. This whole motif, this subject has turned into a series of paintings. Here I am working on one, direct observation. You'll notice this is actually two canvases. This one wasn't big enough so I had a smaller one and just put them together. I like that idea of allowing a painting to grow organically. If it needs to be bigger, just Go get another canvas and let it be bigger. There's a detail of it in process. There's a second painting in process. The thing about the wasachi tree, it blooms in March and it lasts until about early April. And then all the blooms start falling off. So sometimes I have to wait a year in terms of working from photographic source as opposed to on location. Now, here's a field of wildflowers. The common name is Mexican hat. These were everywhere when I was a kid. I mean, all over Edinburgh, you hit spring and there they were. Uh, And I've had older citizens come up to me. I remember when those were everywhere. And yeah, so do I. The funny thing is, if you go out on 281 north of our communities, north of Edinburgh, where the state has seeded the highways, highway beautification, they seed wildflowers. And this is a wildflower species that is native to our region and does very well in our semi-arid subtropical environment. Miles, three, four miles of flowers. You come inside the city limits and the city's just mowing them down like weeds. They don't care. They're in the way. These grew up near my house and I documented them. And with the express intention of making paintings based on these documentation. And there you go. There's one in process. It's a small painting. There's another, even smaller. The photographic source, utilizing a photographic source, allows me to manipulate the composition. I'm not just copying the photograph directly. I'm picking and choosing, and I'm compiling a composition based on the material that I've accumulated. There's a finished version. And then this one's in the show. This one's about six feet long, maybe closer to seven. And yes, it's the row of flowers growing by the roadside, but I've picked and choose what flowers to show what flowers to to utilize. So the composition is my invention, but it's based off of the photographic references. There's practical applications. It's a very different painting if I go outside and try to paint the wildflowers directly. It's just a very different painting. And guess what? They're not going to be there very long. You know, I find that painting is these days a rather punctuated activity. I mean, I spend time every day doing something, but to do a large painting takes time. And I wanted to scale this up and show it large so we have a presence and be rather purposeful in its presentation. That's kind of hard to do when the flowers are there a month and then gone. One of the great things of our age is the ubiquitous nature of the photograph. All right. Everybody's got a one of these in their pocket. By the way, just because you've got this in your pocket doesn't mean you're a photographer, but it's a very good documentation tool. It's your sketchbook. You can collect information. And if you're doing the thing where you're drawing on location or painting on location and then document the, the subject matter and then pull it back in the studio and work on the painting and then go back out, you get this give and take situation, this push pull situation. It's really quite fruitful. The photograph gives us certain things. It gives us the position of the object. It can give us reference to value scales. It can make some suggestion to color. This is another 
another example of photographic reference that I used for a painting. This was at the Municipal Park in Edinburgh. They had they took an old reservoir. They turned it into a nature park, a bird sanctuary. Right? They planted a, a couple acres of native growth, and now the birds go in there. And, you know, it's a good environment for them. They don't mind all the crap. I like the flowers of the prickly pear cactus. They're so beautiful. They come out pink. They come out yellow. They come out white. They're very translucent. And I wanted to turn that into a painting. Also, again, to demonstrate the, the value of our local ecology. The cicada skins are from direct observation. So again, I'm amalgamating things. I'm picking and choosing from different photographic sources, and then I'm introducing observed information. There it is. It's finished. This painting's also in the show. And if you look closely, see this cup right here turned upside down? See that little brown blob? That is a cicada skin. That's a motif that I introduce into my work for personal reasons. Well, when I was a kid in the summer times and the chichadas were out, we'd run around catching them. That was the fun thing, collecting the skins. You know, how many did you get today? You know, uh, every now and then you get a skin where the chichada was still inside. And that was always fun and exciting. In Edinburgh in the 70s, when I was a young child, in the summers, the cicadas were so incredibly loud. They were so prolific. There were so many of them. You and I could be outside standing five feet apart and could not hear each other because they were that dominant. They were that, you know, you could hear them inside all day long. I don't hear that anymore. Not in the city. And you go out to the countryside, same story, but in the city limits, you know, every now and then you hear one. So we've turned a corner. We've changed. I want to talk about drawing a little bit. But yes, photography is part of the process. Drawing is also part of the process. Here I am at one of the trees that I like to go to. It's a, I have specific locations that I'll revisit, and I'm drawing. I'm using watercolor, but it's still a drawing. I call it a drawing because of the way I'm using line. There's an ink and brush drawing, just studying the motion of the trees, right? Studying the marks, studying the branches, how they, how they relate to each other. There's a close-up of one. That's the tree that's over in the stadium parking lot. I find it very helpful to spend time drawing from my subjects just so I get to know them better. You know, it's a get to know you moment. And the painting's about color quite often. The drawing is much more about form. There's a location on Sprague Street in Edinburgh across from a, a, what's now a water park. It used to be a citrus grove. And the plot of ground that the mesquite trees are on used to be somebody's front yard. You can still see the foundation of their house in what used to be somebody's homestead with a pasture behind it. And then now it's, uh, I think it's owned by the city. And so far they've left the trees alone. And I hope they will continue to do so. This is an interesting one. This is actually in San Antonio. I had a friend who lived in San Antonio, our friend David Freeman. I'd go up and visit him once in a while. And there was an overpass near his house. And on the other side of the overpass was was this huge pin oak tree and it was really really quite large obviously been around for at least a century and i started drawing it in terms of process notice that this is comprised of individual panels this is a cardstock they're about 11 by 12 for magazine collectors they have these cards that you can slip into a mylar bag that the, you can store the magazine in and the card keeps the magazine stiff they're acid free because you don't want acid leaking into your magazine you're trying to save, but they're a great, great thing to draw on. It's a slick surface. It's acid-free. It's wonderful. They have them over at the comic book store. Okay. So the idea here was I'd be drawing the tree. I'd run out of space, put down another card, draw on that, run out of space, put down another card. So the whole thing starts to grow organically, not unlike the tree. These are smaller. These are like seven by 10, I think, comic book size. And that's oak tree that's growing up in Edinburgh in what used to be North Junior High. Actually, it used to be Pan American College. And then the uh, school district bought it over. You know, you get a diptych going is what it's called. Where you're using multiple surfaces for a single image. If you have two, it's called a diptych. If you have three, it's called a triptych. Why am I doing all this? What's the point, right? All right, Lyles, you're out there in the heat painting mesquite trees. Yeah, okay, flowers. Yeah, okay, why? This is the Saldere, the salt flats north of Edinburgh. Been around for centuries, since probably the last ice age. We have some amazing things in our region in terms of our ecology, our geology. We're unique in the contiguous continental United States. There's no place like this. Culturally, certainly so. But ecologically, you know, we're this semi-arid, subtropical region with species that can't be found anywhere else in the United States. The ocelot going extinct, ocelot. 
Good luck trying to find those somewhere else. As our region has emerged as a suburban environment, as we've shifted from an agrarian economy to a service sector economy, we're losing our ecology. It is feasible to maintain our local flora and fauna, our ecology, and still develop economically. You can have suburban green spaces, but it means making commitments to plant local, to plant native. Okay. Our municipalities, our city governments actually have a lot of power in this area. They can pass ordinances. Okay, Walmart, you want to build a new facility? Great. We need jobs. You know what? Every 50 feet in your parking lot, you need to plant a tree and it has to be a native species because that great big asphalt parking lot radiates heat and the interior temperature of our city goes up and it's very uncomfortable. You know, 110 degree heat by 10 o'clock in the morning in downtown McAllen. Gee, thanks. We can play it smart. It's not too late. We can still do it. We're never going to go back to, you know, ranchero days. That's done. The decision's been made. We're an urban developing environment, but we can still have native flora, native fauna. We can still plant native. You can still have green space. And yes, it matters. These are the trees I was telling you about in Edinburgh. Beautiful old growth mesquite trees, at least 80 years old. And my concern is somebody from the city council is going to go, "Eh, we need a parking lot, cut those down because I've seen it happen time and time again. Developer comes in or a city comes, you know, city government comes in and they just rip it all down like it's garbage. It's not. It's our legacy. It's our history. It's who we are. You know, you don't find mesquite trees like this in San Antonio. You don't. I said that the valley had stuff that wasn't found anywhere else. This is Montezuma cypress. It's over 900 years old, just like the sign says. This is down just past the border wall, kind of between McAllen and Hidalgo. It's on private land, but they allow you to come and and look at it. There used to be a lot of these down there. Now, this tree's dying. If you look, you can see how the bark's pulling away. It's dying of thirst. And that's not a man-made problem. What happened was the river changed its course. Rivers do that. They alter their course. Our river just happens to be an international boundary. But it changed its course. Its roots are no longer making contact with the river. It's dying of thirst. There's a sign out there that invites people to bring water. You know, people just go out there and sort of ceremoniously pour a bucket of water on the tree. Okay, that's a nice thing to do. It's not really going to help. Sorry. This tree used to not be alone. There was a lot like it. Now there's a lot fewer of them. But I bring this to your attention because it's 900 years old. When I was a kid in the valley, I heard constantly people griping. about There's nothing here. There's nothing to it. It's so boring. It's all flat. Really? 900-year-old tree. You know what this means? This means that when Christopher Columbus was lost in the Caribbean 500 years ago, lost, he didn't know where he was. He thought he was in Japan. This tree was already 400 years old. This tree was here before the United States existed, before Mexico existed, before the Spanish knew that the world was not flat. That's my daughter, my youngest daughter. She was about 11, I think, when we took that picture. What do you want to leave to your children? I know it sounds real cliche and kind of corny, but it's true. What do you want to leave to your children? What type of valley do you want the next generation to have? Yes, we need economic development. We still have multi-generational poverty. We still have folks who are barely scratching a living. Yes, we need economic development. Yes, we need jobs. Yes, we need economic diversification. Orange trees and farming isn't going to cut it. You need more. But in the middle of all of that development, we can still maintain who we are in terms of our ecology. We can still have suburban green spaces. We can still preserve what's best about where we are because it's a part of who we are. And now I'm done. I drew that cartoon. This is really great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it.